Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today, um, whether you're in person or online. We have um, an exciting panel of people today to talk to us. Um, so we're going to go ahead and um, jump right in and get started. And uh, so the first person I'd like to introduce today is Janelle Ola Miller. Um, she works with Willowstone Family Services, which she'll tell you more about. She's a licensed clinical social worker and a certified clinical trauma professional. She received her Master's of Arts from the University of Chicago. But I did hear you say that you were a graduate from HHS, one of the first graduates of HHS when liberal arts um, combined with um, CD, uh, CFS to be HHS. So um, we have a fellow alum amongst us, those of you that are part of HHS or any part of Purdue. Um, Janelle has been working in the field of social work for more than seven years and has experience working with patients um, to address depression, anxiety, trauma, adjustment difficulties, grief, caregiving, difficulties related to medical issues. She has experience with all ages, um, teenagers and children um, ages six plus. She is gender affirming provider and enjoys working with members of the LGBTQ plus community. She is a member of the Star Behavioral Health Provider Network and is trained to work with military personnel and family members. Janelle also serves as a pastor in a local congregation. She is experienced in discussing diverse spiritual concerns when people want or need to for their mental health, including any form of religion or spirituality, as well as harm experienced because of the actions of people or communities of faith. So please um, join me in welcoming Janelle today. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, I am super thrilled to be here, and just so you know, I am, uh, I've never had any presentation I've made projected onto slides this big. So um, this is very exciting for me, new learning opportunity. I often tell my clients that nervousness and excitement are the same physiological experience. It's a matter of what story you're telling yourself. So am I nervous? No way! So excited, so happy to be here. Uh, I want to tell you about Willowstone. Um, Willowstone Family Services has been in the Lafayette community since 1964, um, and we provide evidence-based services focused on strengthening individuals and families across the lifespan. We focus on mental health counseling and parent support, um, and we're located on 18th Street right next to Union. So these are our services. I will be telling you a little bit more about each of them in detail. Um, I just kind of wanted to give you the lay of the land of what it means when I say parent support and mental health counseling. Um, our parent support services include early intervention, um, baby talk is an early intervention program, healthy families also early intervention, and then our other supports include Get Smart Junior, um, which is a group for teenagers, and uh, coming soon we're going to be starting a parent cafe program, which is a peer-based uh, support program for parents. Willowstone has five values that guide how we operate and everything that we do. Um, our primary value is high quality client care and then uh, going on from there we value accessibility, affordability, integrity, innovation, and collaboration. Um, this picture here is from our most recent little like staff togetherness experience where we all wore ugly holiday sweaters um, and took silly pictures. This is not the whole staff, a lot of people were with clients at this time. Um, but I share this picture because I want to emphasize that at Willowstone, when we think about fostering belonging for our clients, we know that starts with fostering belonging for our staff. We cannot give what we do not have, right? So we are very intentional about creating opportunities for our staff to support each other, get to know each other, spend time together um, as part of the work week. Another example um, that I'm really passionate about sharing, whoops, I talk with my hands a lot, um, is that in our therapy department, uh, all of the therapists have an hour on their schedule every single week where they are not scheduled to see any clients and they are just supposed to talk to each other about whatever. Work-related, not work-related, I don't know, I'm not there because I'm a supervisor, so that's where they can talk about me if they want to, you know. Um, and that's just part of their regular work day. Um, that's something that we started doing in the pandemic because we realized that we were not talking to each other anymore, we missed each other. So we cultivate that sense of belonging on our staff on purpose because we know that we are aspiring to create that in the lives of all of our clients. 
So the programs that we have, um, I'm going in order of the lifespan. We have Baby Talk, which is early intervention in the hospital. Our Baby Talk staff have visited just in the, the first three quarters of 2022. They visited 1,964 parents um, at Lafayette's two hospitals and provided 447 hours of visits. So these visits are fairly brief, you know, I don't know um, how many of you have been in the hospital with a newborn, but there's not a lot of downtime. Uh, so they come in, they offer um, to connect them with local resources, they give them some basic information about infant care, and they start talking right then and there, day one, about encouraging that sense of belonging and connection with your child by reading to them. Um, they provide books um, in English and Spanish for the clients that they meet. Healthy Families um, intervenes with children ages zero to three, um, again, by focusing on parent support and education. Um, so our Healthy Family staff foster belonging and well-being by intervening in the years in which we learn what those words mean, basically. Our sense of belonging in the world and with each other and other people starts in those early years when we're developing our understanding of attachment um, and what, what the world is like and whether the world is safe. So we focus on um, educating parents about child development um, and you know, making sure they have access to health care and local resources, talking with them about setting boundaries with kids and positive discipline and things like that as early as we can. Um, in the beginning, Healthy Family staff members visit about once a week <clears throat> when the child is a newborn. And then those visits become a little less frequent when the child grows older. Um, since we do cover from age zero to three, um, our healthy family staff members often have a relationship with that family for several years because oftentimes by the time there's a three-year-old, there might also be a one-year-old, right? And so that, that healthy family's person is staying with the family um, as much as possible. So we're investing in families at that crucial, crucial stage, which is preventative um, and also just really equipping them in that time. Moving up the lifespan, Get Smart Junior is a prevention program for teenagers. This is a five-week group. Um, the model for it was developed here in Lafayette by Lisa Wirth, who works at Cala Collaborative Health. Um, and we have a licensed therapist who does this group specifically focused on substance use prevention um, and education for teenagers. Uh, this is open to anyone. You don't need a referral from uh, probation, although we do sometimes get those. We often serve teenagers in this group whose parents are just concerned about them and want, to, want them to have the information they need to make choices that will help them live the life they want. So the facilitator focuses on cultivating those skills and that understanding to prepare those teenagers not only for their experiences in high school but also um, work, college, and beyond. And then finally, our counseling services. This is the one that I wrote the most about and I'm most passionate about because obviously it's the department that I serve. Um, counseling is incredibly important. It's um, a huge part of what we do. Um, in the first three quarters of 2022, I'm gonna back up. When we're talking about our statistics for um, counseling healthy families and get smart, we lump those all together because we have clients that cross pollinate between. Right? We see healthy families' parents for counseling sometimes, or sometimes I refer a client to healthy families. Sometimes we have clients that come to us through Get Smart and then become a counseling client. So those groups are, are all kind of blended together, and, and oftentimes those families are receiving multiple services from multiple providers from our organization. So in the first three quarters of 2022, Willowstone provided 5,048 hours of service to 878 people through those three programs. And of these clients, 63% um, have low income or live below the poverty line. One of the things that makes Willowstone unique in the area um, and, and the biggest reason why I work there is we serve the most economically diverse client base of any other agency in the community, especially when it comes to mental health because we accept any kind of insurance you could possibly imagine. All the private insurances, employee assistance programs with several local employers, Medicare, Medicaid, um, sliding fee scale, uh, private pay, although that's fairly rare as you might imagine, uh, marketplace plans. And that sliding fee scale is not just for clients who don't have insurance, although 
we use it for that too. It's also for clients whose insurance copay is not affordable. Paying $104 out of pocket with health insurance is not affordable. That flooding fee scale is funded by the United Way, which is a huge partner with us in what we do and everything we serve, every person we serve. So our therapists are focused on creating that belonging and well-being for clients and helping that client to then spread that, right, in their family, in their workplace, in their community. As I said, we kind of lump all of these groups together, and so I have some statistics about, like, who is it that we're serving in Healthy Families and Get Smart and the counseling program. Um, we serve a, the entire community, which means that our population our, of our clients is diverse as well. So of our clients um, for those three programs, 51% are white, 9% are multiracial, 20% are Latinx, 19% are black, and 1% are Asian. Um, and then 20% of our counseling clients are members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, all of our therapists have been trained by the Purdue LGBTQ Center um, on safe zone training and trans inclusion training. Um, that is a constantly growing need in our community and it's something that we're really passionate about. So thinking of all of these services that we provide, another thing that I wanna help you understand as you're thinking about the landscape of so many area organizations is who does Willowstone serve and what makes us different from, for example, a community mental health center like Valley Oaks. Valley Oaks gets funding to provide services for people who are in that red zone, right? They are the best place in town for that because you can walk in there and you'll get a therapist, a case manager, a psychiatrist, a peer support specialist. You might be able to do an inpatient stay. You might get an, an, an partial hospitalization, all kinds of services. There's a big gap for the yellow and orange and, and even green that a lot of, there's an unmet need in our community and that's the area where Willowstone focuses. We're trying to focus on meeting people in that middle range um, and helping them to get to the green range. We do have some clients that don't thrive when they're with us and we end up needing to refer them to a place that has more supportive services. Um, but mainly, uh, we have really good um, statistics on how, how effective our services are in helping people meet their goals and eventually graduate. Um, I tell every client on my first session with them that my job as a therapist to, is to work myself out of a job. I want you to not need me. And so let's figure out what needs to happen to get you to that point. Um, so that's kind of trying to give you a landscape. Like a, we're trying to prevent people from getting worse and, and slipping into dysfunction. And we're trying to help people to stay um, doing the things they wanna do, serving in the ways they wanna serve. So that's kind of an overview of what Willowstone does. Um, I wanna let you know how you can support us. First off, join us. We love hiring Purdue alum. Uh, we love it and we would love to have you as part of our team. We have lots of different opportunities for that. We also have internships um, for people who are you know, still in school or just wanting to test something out. You can volunteer with us. Our parent cafe is going to need volunteers to help those parents be able to pay attention to their peer supports uh, and, and keep the kids doing something fun and constructive in another room. Uh, you can donate. Uh, you can find the donation information on our website. Um, and there is a code that you can use to indicate <coughs> that you learned about Willowstone at this event. Um, and finally, you can be one of our clients or refer someone you know. Um, we are here, we take your insurance, I guarantee. <laughs> well, maybe I shouldn't guarantee. I think there's like one person that I know of that we don't take their insurance and they have a sliding fee scale. But we would love to be a part of your story of how you go to thriving um, from wherever you are on the spectrum. I think I did it in exactly 15 minutes. Whew. Um, anybody have any questions I can answer before, like anything burning, but also you can find me after. Yeah, we're going to do questions at the end. Great. Forever. Thank you very yep. much. Awesome. Sorry. Thank you, Janelle. I was so excited to get started earlier that um, I didn't even introduce myself or a few other things that we had to do. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kermin Morrow, and I work um, with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion out of the Dean's Office in the College of Health and Human Sciences. 
um, if you are going to talk at the end, we're going to hold all questions to the end. If you are going to talk at the end, please make sure when you hit the button that you hold it down the entire time um, because that's what's going to help us with the recording um, and people being able to hear you online. Like, I know I don't need this microphone for you all to hear me in here because my voice carries, but we're using it because of the people on um, that were there online as well because we have about 120 people that have joined us online today. So next up, I'm going to introduce some wonderful people from the Center for Healthy Living, and um, I don't, I didn't go in order. So Jessica McKeever um, is a registered dietitian. She got her Master's of Science um, in Nutrition and Dietetics. Her interests and specializations are cardiac, hypertension, gastrointestinal, pediatrics, pregnancy nutrition, plant-based nutrition, and Mediterranean nutrition. Um, she joined the uh, Center for Healthy Living in August of 2022, so welcome. Um, and before that, she spent uh, seven years at St. Franciscan Health uh, Lafayette working with a variety of inpatient and outpatient clients. And next we have Amanda Hathcock. Um, she is a limited licensed professional counselor and a national certified counselor. Um, she got her Bachelor's of Arts um, from Albion College, and she got a Master's of Arts from Oakland University. Her interests and specializations are Certified Human Animal Interaction Specialist and PATH Certified Instructor, which stands for Professional Association for Therapeutic Horsemanship. She joined the Center for Healthy Living in 2018. Uh, when she first started her work, she began working with grant-funded or before that, I should say, before the Center for Healthy Living, she began working with grant-funded public mental health providers and in the public school system in, in Michigan and often working with adolescents and young adults. And she moved to Indiana and worked at IU um, Health Arnett as a behavioral health consultant before joining um, Center for Healthy Living. And Whitney Soto. Whitney is a registered um, nurse health coach. Is that right? How to say it? Okay. Um, she got her um, Bachelor's of Nursing RN an accelerated bachelor, in an accelerated bachelor program from St. Elizabeth School of Nursing, where she graduated summa cum laude. She also received a Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology from Colby Sawyer College. Her interests and specializations are organization, time management. We might need to talk. <laughs> Not for, the, not for the time management, the stress relief and the organization, right? Uh, Plant-based eating, chronic disease, and goal setting. She joined the Center for Healthy Living in January 2018, and before that, she worked in dermato dermatology and also um, at a psychiatric hospital. In addition to working at the Center for Healthy Living, she also works as needed in the urgent care center. So please uh, join me in welcoming um, all of our participants today from the Center for Healthy Living. Thank you guys. Um, I have the clicker here. So we are gonna look at some different parts of sense of belonging and grow, expand hopefully on um, what these uh, MLK presentations have been, have been looking at so far. There you go. Um, our five main topics here are gonna be creating environments of belonging, stress relief, animals and belonging, your brain on food, and mental health resources. So for creating environments of belonging, if I understand the synopsis of the presentations so far, um, you guys have already looked at uh, the definitions of environments of belonging and sense of belonging. Um, you've looked at the what, what is a sense of belonging. And so I want to jump right into the why? <laughs> um, why build environments for belonging? And that is synonymous with what is your motivation for building environments of belonging? Um, perhaps it, the first thing that comes to mind is, well, because I should, <laughs> because somebody, some entity, um, something beyond me is saying that, saying that I should. And for the rule following people pleasers out there, maybe that's enough. Maybe that's all we need to, to jump on board and to 
um, really engage with building these environments of belonging. Um, but for the maybe more independent um, boundary pushers, that's probably not gonna gonna fuel you all the way through. Uh, is it for others? And others might be uh, employees. It might be friends. It might be youth, either your own or ones that you're associated with or just youth in general. Um, and it could be when we're looking at building these environments of belonging for others, it could be from kind of a, an altruistic angle or it could be from more of a methodical angle. And either way, they are both ethically sound and awesome and embrace whichever one <laughs> you you resonate with. Um, altruistic means like if for me, like I want said group of employees to feel like they belong. I want my friends to feel like they belong. Methodical would be more like research shows that <laughs> sense that um, employees who feel like they belong, um, that there's less turnover in those work environments or there's more engagement, whatever that is. Um, so there's more, I guess, like science or research behind it. But that is absolutely still a valid motivator and a valid why. Um, perhaps it's for yourself. Um, is it because I want to feel like I belong somewhere different, somewhere deeper? Is it because I want to grow in social awareness and maybe that is going to get in my way with me and empathy. <laughs> um, I want to grow in social awareness and empathy. And that's a practice. Um, so building those environments of belonging is a practice for us. And we get to experience, thank you Jessica, <laughs> we get to experience um, social awareness and we get to trial and error with social awareness and with empathy. Um, we're not nobody's perfect and so we all need those environments to practice into and to um, to build with lastly or a part of that I guess would be um, more and more the what has been dubbed soft skills uh, historically we're finding are the core skills right that's what we need and so um, why build an environment of belonging maybe it's to use these core soft skills uh, briefly, why why look at why? What does it matter? This is interesting, Amanda. This is interesting to learn about myself a little bit like that, but why does that matter? Um, and that's because if we don't hone in on our why and really acknowledge our personal why, then we're only going to work on building environments of belonging or maintaining those environments of belonging when we're told to and when our progress is going to be monitored, right? Um, and so when we tap into our authentic why, there's sustainable motivation there. We'll consistently be encouraged internally to work towards something, work towards that environment of belonging. All right, so we've got the what and the why. Now, how about where? Again, if I understand the synopsis correctly, um, we've already looked at community-wide how to start or looking at belonging maybe college-wide if we shrink it down a little bit, all the way down to workplace and small group. But what about with yourself? Do you really feel like you belong with yourself? Do you curate an environment of belonging with yourself? I would start with, I think that starts as a feeling, but then you might say, man, I don't even know what that is or what that might be. Um, okay, so it might start with self-care. Um, do you designate time and energy to care for yourself, to relax, to eat, to sleep, to exercise? Uh, it might look like self-talk. Um, do you talk kindly to yourself in your head? Are you encouraging to yourself in your head? Um, or is it a constant self-competition, I guess, or, or um, always always self trying to self-improve? Even if both of those are, you're like, yep, Amanda, I do the self-care thing. Yep, self-talk is check. Um, how many of you, at times, identify as being your own worst enemy? Got a few hands. 
and that's normal and that's okay. <laughs> and um, we, I want to take this opportunity to um, apply a, um, a relaxation exercise or a, a grounding exercise, I guess, um, to work on minimizing that, that worst enemy, being our own worst enemy in ourselves. Um, it's called color breathing. I don't know if anybody is familiar with it. Um, so if you are willing to close your eyes and participate, that would be great. If you just want to lean back and get comfy and participate, that is great too. I'm going to walk you through it so you won't need to be reading the slide. Um, in order to start color breathing, we're going to get comfy. We are going to give our self-critic, that inner self-critic, give it a color. And I'll give you a minute to play around with a couple different colors, what that might look like or represent for you. And once you've got your color and you're visualizing it, each time you exhale, I want you to visualize that color, which represents your self-critic, your inner self-critic, and that color is leaving your body. So we're exhaling out all of that self-criticism. And breathing in fresh air. And you could stay right here for a few more breaths if you'd like. Or you could additionally consider a color that represents self-love. What color is on the other side of that self-critic? And if you chose a color for self-love, each time you inhale, I'd invite you to imagine that color filling up your body, maybe filling in the spaces that were left when that self-critic got exhaled for a little bit. And then as naturally as possible, if your eyes are closed, maybe you can slowly open them back up, but start to detach your focus from those colors and the breathing. And come on back to whether it's the auditorium here or your screen if you're joining online. That was just one application for color breathing. Color breathing is great for sleep. It's great for stress reduction. Um, with a couple added steps, it's really useful for pain relief or like chronic pain um, management as well. We've done what, why, where, now, <laughs> and jump into the how. Um, so how do we... Um, facilitate, I guess, a, uh, an environment of belonging with ourselves? And the short answer is self-compassion. Um, but the uh, mainstream definition, I guess, of self-compassion is something along the lines of treating ourselves with the same kindness we treat others, which is accurate, but maybe not as precise <laughs> as it could be. Um, because we have, I think a lot of us at least have habitualized other compassion. It's natural and even instinctive. It's habitual to, sh to give compassion, to verbalize compassion to other people. We take a lot of steps or we've taken a lot of steps and we've combined it all into this one big ball of saying nice, saying kind things to other people. And that works when we're saying it to other people, right? If a coworker comes up to me and says, oh, I have this really stressful thing going tonight, I tell them, you know, um, oh, that does sound stressful. I'm sure you'll do great and you can tell me all about it tomorrow. And when I walk away from that conversation, I really believe that they're going to be fine and they'll do great and I'll see them tomorrow and it's not going to bog me down usually for the most part, hopefully. <laughs> um, 
Whereas if I have a stressful thing going on after work today and I jump straight to telling myself, oh, you've got this, you'll be fine, it'll be okay, and you'll you'll tell people about it tomorrow. How long do you believe it? About as long as it took the words to leave our mouths, usually, or maybe. (laughs) That would be for me. And so with self-compassion, oftentimes it takes slowing down and breaking down that habit that we formed of all of these steps combined and just kind of throwing kind words at things and breaking it apart so that we can really believe it. The first step in self-compassion, in the self-compassion cycle, is being present moment with yourself. Um, In other words, being real with yourself, being um, strictly (laughs) real with yourself. Um, That might look like, you know, I I own the ground I stand on, I, I deserve the chair I'm sitting in, and I feel whatever feelings I feel and I think whatever thoughts I think period and those things aren't good and they're not bad they're not pretty they're not ugly they just are that's my it's my it's me it is me in this moment and while I might be feeling maybe I'm feeling angry about something that was just said to me all right but now in this moment when I'm identifying feeling angry about that Now, nothing else in the room, no one else affects that. That's first step, right? Um, Everybody else in the room can be joyful and happy, and I can still be angry. And that's okay, because I am me, and I own this space. And while that can be really empowering to own the space and to own my feelings, it can also be kind of lonely. (laughs) So the second step in the self-compassion cycle is then relating to others. To run with my example, okay, so I'm angry about this thing that was said to me, and I can, uh, I think I can safely postulate that somebody else in the world has been angry about something that somebody said to them, <laughs> and, and maybe been in a room full of happy people, right, and had to deal with a very similar situation that I'm going through. Maybe I know their face and their name, and I have their phone number logged into my phone. Or maybe it's just... I'm believing that somebody else in the world has been through something similar to this. Either way, we're connecting, we're relating outside of ourselves. So I've gotten real with myself and identified where I'm at. I've connected with the world outside of me. And now we jump or we build to step three, which is being kind to ourselves, using kind words, um, taking a snack break if I haven't eaten all day, whatever whatever being kind to myself looks like in that moment. And at first we it doesn't feel quite as sound and solid as when I give that sorry when I give that compassionate statement to other people. Um, but but we we believe it a little bit longer than just as it comes out of our mouth <laughs> and we can keep building on that um, until we have that sense of belonging with ourselves, that we can then share with other people and use to build those environments of belonging outside of ourselves. Briefly, self-compassion that I just talked about fuels a cycle where if I have self-compassion with myself, then I can learn and grow. Um, And then I'm willing to try either something again or try something new. And it probably won't go perfectly because next to nothing goes perfect in this world. So then I will use self-compassion to learn and grow and try it again or try something new. And we go around the cycle that way. When we feel like we don't have time to build a sense of belonging with ourselves. um, I need to focus on other people. I need to do all these other things first before I can work on that. Okay, if I don't belong with myself though, then I'm most likely to withdraw. And if I withdraw, there's at least not any more belonging being felt or built. There's probably less, honestly, which just fuels this feeling of not belonging and we get in this vicious kind of backward cycle. Um, So self-compassion is more than 10 seconds that you take to break it down and (laughs) and talk nicely to yourself. It's going to build and expand and help everybody else around you. There we go. All right, so moving on then to stress relief. Because all of this talk about 
building belonging with ourselves can be kind of stressful, right? Um, Stress is our body telling us that something is either wrong or maybe it's just that something is imperfect. Just because our body stresses about something or identifies something doesn't mean that it's wrong or bad necessarily. Uh, We can fall into that kind of generalization. Some symptoms of stress physically include headaches, stomach aches, general aches and pains, um, fatigue. It builds all the way up to a more severe pain, can even end up resulting in high blood pressure and skin irritation, um, such as stress hives. Um, It's basically our body saying, um, we're allergic to life. Thanks for playing. And go on with your day, right? (laughs) Um, It's not fun. Uh, Some mental emotional symptoms of stress uh, might start with worry, um, generalized worry, maybe about something that you know, if, if when I know what I'm worried about, sometimes that's more helpful, or maybe there's just this sense of worry. Um, A and T on the slide there stands for automatic negative thoughts. Um, our brain is hardwired to protect us when it sees something that is out of the norm. Negative thinking automatically occurs, not because you're a negative person, but because our brain is trying to protect us. Um, but that often leads to irritability when those automatic negative thoughts build up. Um, difficulty relaxing. Uh, And it can build up into chronic self-doubt, into avoidance of uh, events and things, um, all the way to hopelessness. If you ever experience hopelessness or you identify the feeling that you're feeling as hopelessness, I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to reach out to anybody that you feel like you can confide in. Um, It could be a professional, but it could be a friend. It could be anybody that um, that you can connect with in that moment. Um, hopelessness is kind of like the ultimate stuck in our brain, and it is most helpful to have somebody to connect to to help, uh, help redirect our thoughts with that. So relieving those things. Um, there's two major ways to go about stress relief. We could add relaxation, do something fun, do something fun because you could, not because you should. Um, breathing exercises, breathing in general, uh, mindfulness, relaxation, meditation, any of that um, category of relaxation. Um, tension release, our stress builds up in our body. We get really tense muscles, so tension release is a way to add relaxation. And then looking at one thing. Um, we tend to kid ourselves today and think and say that we're multitasking. We say we're always multitasking. And I would say most often we're always just split focused. <laughs> and so if you can choose one thing to focus on for a minute, that's 60 seconds of relaxation for your brain. Um, if you can think of one thing that you want to add for relaxation, um, I'm up here throwing tens of things at you guys if you can choose one and commit to adding it somewhere in your day um, that's going to be stress relieving the other category next to adding relaxation would be reducing stressors that usually means building maintaining um, redefining some boundaries Um, that might mean prioritizing differently um It means external processing. So when we've got stress and thoughts and things built up in our body, it's putting it in writing. It's putting it into uh, some kickboxing gloves. It's putting it, um, it's putting that that energy and those thoughts somewhere else besides carrying them around in our body all day. Um, Otherwise known as outletting. Um, And with the time that we have today, I want to focus on adding relaxation because there are always going to be things in life that we do control could control with a few changes and then things that we don't control period the weather is a prime example but not maybe the most relatable Um, there's always going to be things that we don't control though and so often I hear oh yeah I'll get to adding relaxation as soon as I reduce the stressors over here Yeah, I'll get to that as soon as this. And we put adding relaxation on the back burner. We think that that's like the the icing on the cake, maybe. But 
adding relaxation is just as important as reducing or decreasing the stressors because we are aiming for something that feels better than just neutral. And if I spend all of my time and all of my energy reducing all of the negative, the stressors that I do control, I'm still going to be less with, left with a bunch of stressors that I don't control. And so at best, I break even. But if we convince our selves, our habitual brains, that, <laughs> that we can take a few minutes for us to add something relaxing, now we start to tip the scale, hopefully, um, even if we were to hit that break-even point, now we're going to tip the scales towards feeling relaxed, being relaxed, having done something compassionate for ourselves because we prioritized adding relaxation. I'm pretty sure I have time for a muscle relaxation exercise. Um, I, in the past, have called... Um, I'll rephrase the quickest way to find this type of thing on google would be progressive muscle relaxation <laughs> um, i have been known to call it rubber band muscles or the rubber band muscle exercise um, i found a new analogy that i really like which is the coat hook um, the coat hook muscle analogy our muscles are Hmm. Our muscles tense and relax based on a chemical format. I am not a chemist or a biology major, so like that, this, that's layman's terms right there. Um, but I do know that if we focus immediately on trying to relax those muscles, we can only change that chemical balance so much and for so long before either we have to refocus or um, our body just can't do it purposefully anymore. But if we first, it goes counterintuitive to what we're thinking we want to do, but if we first tense those muscles even more um, than they already are based on st or because of stress, and we purposefully tense those muscles just a little bit more before we let go, it's like a rubber band or a slingshot or kind of like a coat hook analogy where I want to get the coat down, right? But if I just yank on the coat and pull it down, I'm going to rip it. I got to lift it up first to get it over that hook and our muscles are really similar if we go straight to trying to pull them down to relax them they'll bend a little bit but we'll get a lot further if we tense them first unhook them and then get to experience upwards of two minutes of muscle relaxation that we're not purposefully doing so if you're willing to practice with me we're gonna go toast head um, and we can start by Giving your toes a nice gentle squeeze. Don't hurt yourself, but for four seconds, we're going to squeeze our toes in our shoes as much as you can, whatever that looks like um, for you, and let them go. Relax those toes. Consider if you feel anything different in your toes or not. We're going to move up to our ankles and lower legs. I'm not sure what that, how you tense those. I'm going to flex my feet, I guess. But try and squeeze, squeeze the muscles around your ankles, around your lower legs. And release. Consider if anything feels different. Up to our knees, maybe upper legs. giving those a really good squeeze for three or four seconds without hurting ourselves. And then letting them go. Up to our belly, which is where we have, humans have been shown to hold the majority of stress without making yourself sick or hurting yourself, giving your belly a gentle squeeze. And letting it go. We'll jump up to our shoulders. Number two spot where human beings hold the most stress. I'm going to end up looking like a turtle, but whatever it looks like for you. Tensing those shoulder muscles. And letting them go. Second to last, our jaw, the number three spot where we where human beings hold the most stress. Um, 
without hurting yourself. It might look like clenching, it might look like stretching, but try and give tense some muscle in your jaw and then let it go. And finally, it's kind of conceptual, but if you imagine being able to like tense the the skin on top of your head, right, your your forehead maybe, so like scrunching your eyes or just imagining that you could tense that muscle, if it's even a muscle, maybe it's just skin. But anyway, tensing, putting, adding tension to the top of your head, and then letting it go. I usually use my phone, guys. I didn't time it, but usually that takes 90 seconds-ish. could take a couple minutes if you wanted it to, um, but that could be a really useful a, 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 a morning or an afternoon changing 90 seconds to two minutes um, for you. And you can, there's no right or wrong way to break those muscle groups down. You can add your arms in there. You can go head to toe instead of toe to head. Um, do whatever works for you, tailor it for you. All right, so then briefly, I am going to talk about animals and belonging. Um, the human benefit potential of being near, around, living with all animals. Some research says arguably more with fur-covered animals, but either way. If you have a pet, even if you have a pet lizard, it has been shown to decrease blood pressure in, in, after interacting, um, decreasing stress chemicals and hormones at the time of a trigger. So if you had that lizard with you when you got a, a bad phone call, um, Research shows that the stress chemicals in your body would be less so than if you had not been near said pet. Um, attachment, um, we feel, those, so there's feelings of attachment, and then there's the chemical piece of attachment in our bodies. Um, chem, it's essentially chemical belonging um, to go with our theme here of belonging. And so that is increased when we are around animals, and we most of us will naturally personify animals. So are we 100% sure that our pet is happy to see us when we get home? Technically not, but they look dang happy and they act really happy and it makes me feel happy, so we're gonna go with it. <laughs> um, and so we, we, but we personify that and other things to feel that sense of connection, sense of belonging. Um, all of those benefits are true as long as you are a person who likes animals and if you are not a person who likes animals thank you for knowing that about yourself and don't feel bad <laughs> you are not that's not wrong that's not bad um, sometimes I don't know these presentations get into assuming that you're an animal person maybe you're not and that's okay that's really good to know um, so with that in mind um, we then often feed into um, support and or service animals and how, how do we get those benefits all the time or more often, right? Um, and so an emotional support animal is part of a treatment plan that has been issued by a credentialed provider. It's usually, or an example would be if that emotional support animal is part of your wake up routine, part of your reminder, it's helping you to eat on a regular schedule routine. Um, they can be a practiced cognitive redirect. So all animals, if they came and bumped us while we were stuck on a train of thought, would redirect our thinking, right? Um, but they, animals can be used as a very purposeful practiced sequence of cognitive redirect. Um, they can be helpful for symptom coping and many others, but they're part of a treatment plan. Briefly, with emotional support animals, verification can be requested and verified by, say, like housing, um, housing uh, landlords, um, or if you wanted to take said support animal into a different establishment. Um, unlike service animals, those establishments can ask for verification and they can verify that that verification is real. 
Now with a service animal, a service animal performs a duty for their technical term is handler for their owner. And that might be stabilizing um, somebody who is prone to fall or be unsteady, it might be picking things up. Um, now there's um, dogs that are able to, well, animals, not just dogs, that are able to identify um, like blood sugar spikes, blood pressure spikes, um, different, um, different health things like that. Um, a service animal is, for lack of better terms, fully protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And you do not need to verify or prove that um that they are that they are a service animal to go for housing and um for for establishments that um that are going to make your life that are going to make the human's life run normally so you've seen it on the news we hear about it time to time um, there's a bunch of confusing regulation that acknowledges the benefit for owners and people who are in close constant contact with animals um, but there's a, lot, there's a lot less recognition for the benefits of animal assisted therapy, which is human treatment, treatment for a human that is performed by a provider with animal interaction deliberately incorporated. So it could be physical therapy, walking the dog, reaching for the cat, riding the horse, etc. cetera. Um, it can be with counseling. It can be sensory exposure. Um, lots of other examples there. Um, more and more animal-assisted therapy programs and and um, providers are trying to gather research and documentation in pursuit of funding and certification and compliance. Um, and I have the most experience with therapeutic horseback riding. And I have found that it's really interesting and actually another example a more common example might be um the dogs in the prisons um and the inmates are helping to train the dogs and prepare the dogs to go to um, to other homes um, but it's really interesting that the perceived effectiveness of a treatment and, or a program directly correlates with what is mostly seen in the research as a sense of connection but i think it associate it correlates very closely with the sense of belonging that we've been talking about um, in other words, you guys, if somebody says, you know, yes, my mobility improved, my flexibility improved, my, all of these physical therapy things improved, but then they say, um, you know, did, did you feel welcomed by the provider? And they say no, then overall they're going to say, nah, it wasn't that effective. Or flip side, they could say, ah, then my flexibility kind of improved. I'm not really any more mobile than I was, on and on. Did you connect with your provider? Did you feel welcomed by your provider? Yes. And then they're going to say, yes, this was incredibly effective for me. I want to do it again. I think more people should have access to it. So that sense of connection is really important in healing and in growing and in improving in other ways as well. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jessica. Hi, I'm Jessica. I am one of the dietitians at CHL. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about um, your brain on food and eating kind of for mental health. Um, so depression in the United States. So in 2020, an estimated 21 million or 8.4% of adults in the U.S. had at least one major depressive episode. That is increased from 7.1% in 2017. Um, the prevalence of adults with major depressive episode was highest among that 18 to 25 age range, 17% um, of them. Um, and an estimated 4.1 million or 17% of adolescents aged 12 to 17 in the U.S. had at least one major depressive episode and that it had increased from 13.3% in 2017. So I would venture to say these numbers would potentially be even higher now um, after the last few years. 
Um, and about one out of every six adults um, will have depression at some point in their lifetime. Um, a lot of times the traditional treatment is therapy and medication. And while those are very effective and uh, great, also, you know, can good nutrition and a good diet also be part of the solution? Um, and the answer is yes, that's why I'm here. Um, so there's, you know, a few different reasons why this could be the case. Um, so there are several biological processes that could help explain the link between nutrition and our mental health. Um, nutrients that we get from food can provide precursors for neurotransmitters. Those are the, the body's chemical messengers. So less than optimal um, diet of certain nutrients can impact the production and release of those neurotransmitters. Um, so certain eating patterns also can cause inflammation and oxidative stress in our body. So that includes um, in our brain, which might make you know our brain not function as well. Um, and lastly is um, our gut microbiome. So um, you might hear this called, you know, the gut-brain connection, the gut-brain axis. So um, this is being increasingly studied um, for our mental health lately. Um, and so it might, uh, you know, what we eat definitely has an impact on our gut microbiome. Um, and kind of the connection there is it could also have an influence on our brain. Um, so to help us answer this kind of more scientifically, I've included a couple different pieces of research here today. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time getting into the science, but um, just hit some of the key points here. Um, so this one is nutritional aspects of depression in adolescence, a systematic review. So this takes 56 different research articles over a period of time and kind of reviews, um, you know, uh, the connection between nutrition and depression. So, um, you know, the main takeaways for this is the onset of anxiety and mood disorders typically happen at a young age. Anxiety is about six years old, um, mood disorders around 13. So even though it might not be detected to a little bit later in their life, um, the onset is usually pretty young. Um, so certain micronutrient deficiencies, malnutrition, um, you know, lack of a proper diet can negatively impact the physical and mental health of kids. Um, key nutrients there you can see listed to kind of keep an eye on protein, omega-3s, uh, vitamin B12, B6, folate, zinc, iron, and iodine. Um, they also found that kind of a Western dietary pattern with sweetened beverages, fried foods, processed meats, um, bakery items also showed an increased risk of depression um, among the kids. Um, and something also I found interesting with this as well is that um, a mother's nutritional status during pregnancy can also influence the um, developing baby and their long-term mental health as well. Um, so after compiling all this research, the authors of this found that um, there is overwhelming evidence that um, nutrition can impact our mental health as well. Um, and this next piece here, so ultra processed food is positively associated with depressive symptoms among U.S. adults. So this basically found that that, you know, ultra processed foods that we eat that are, you know, pretty common in our diet here um, are higher in fats, sugar, calories, those kinds of things, and generally lower in those vitamins and minerals that our body needs to function at its best. So, um, you know, this was, you know, we can't assume that, the, you know, it's, all people with depression are eating this way. Um, it might just be that those kind of convenience foods are, you know, easier to prepare and those kinds of things. Um, but it's definitely an interesting association. Um, another note with this is that although, you know, a positive association was observed with those ultra processed foods and depressive symptoms, um, it was only true among adults who weren't very physically active. So um, not to say that nutrition doesn't play an important role in our mental health, but um, you know, a less than perfect diet, um, if you have some physical activity, it might kind of offset that a little bit. So our brain makes up about 2% of our total body's weight, but uses about 20% of the energy or the calories that we um, eat on a daily basis. So, um, what can we do to fuel that? Um, so eating a wide variety of nutrient dense foods. So we'll kind of go into that a little bit here. So 
Um, you know, I said build your powerhouse plate. So the main thing um, I like to point out to a lot of people is trying to include quality foods from all of the different food groups. So um, vegetables and fruit, making sure you're getting lots of color, lots of variety, um, protein, choosing lean options, fish, chicken, um, those kinds of things healthy fats, um, nuts, seeds, avocado, olive oil, those kinds of things, um, quality carbohydrates, so choosing those whole grain options. Um, these are also where starchy vegetables would fall, so potatoes, corn, peas, those kinds of things. Um, so we shouldn't fear carbohydrates. They're kind of our body's main source of energy, um, so definitely getting a good variety in there. And lastly is water. So making sure, you know, our brain is actually mostly comprised of water, 75%. So, um, you know, dehydration can slow circulation and kind of uh, show a decline in our cognition as well. So making sure you're staying hydrated throughout the day, um, mostly water, kind of trying to avoid those sugar sweetened beverages if we can. And then, I'm going to hand it off to Whitney, who's going to talk a little bit about the mental health resources we have here. Okay. So again, my name is Whitney Soto, and I am a registered nurse. And so I wanted to just let you all know what's available to you um, <laughs> um, through Purdue. So it looks like we may have, you know, faculty, staff, and students from different campuses here today. So I wanted to touch on what is available at some of these locations. Um, starting off with West Lafayette, I don't know if anyone has familiarized yourself with Support Link, um, but it is kind of the newest addition in the mental health resource for West Lafayette campus. So um, you can go to supportlink.com to set up a, um, an account for that. And if you do a Google search for, you know, Support Link Purdue, there is a password associated with that when you set up the account. So I encourage you to look on that. Um, but they do have 24-7, 365 counseling available um, with licensed counselors through that. And you can do it by phone, um, video, text options as well. And they also have several different challenges that you can sign up for on there. Um, and also a plethora of resources, you know, videos, um, articles, pretty much on any topic you can think of. So if you're not gonna utilize it for therapy per se, I would highly recommend registering for it and just checking out what information is on there. Um, there's also that phone number listed as well. And then at the Center for Healthy Living, where we're from, we also have two mental health counselors, Amanda and Melissa is our other one. Um, so Northwest and Fort Wayne have different options available for their um, employee assistance program. So they go through new avenues with Purdue Northwest and they're offered about eight sessions and then they also have um, financial counseling. And that is also something offered on the support link through West Lafayette, some legal and financial counseling as well. Fort Wayne is uh, offered through the Bowen Center. And then the students have CAPS, which has a 24-7 crisis line, and then um, in-person appointments as well. So I know it can be hard to determine through your insurance and benefits what you truly have for coverage and resources. So Purdue actually put this great website together and you can see some of the topics listed here. Um, you know, facts on depression, where to find immediate help, what you know your coverage is for your behavioral health. Um, there's even a section on there, it says RecWell virtual programming. And I tried to look at that a little more before this presentation. There, there was a lot more virtual programming offered for um, physical activity too through the CoREC. I think some of it has gone away, but there is still a, a great amount of information on the CoREC's website as well. Um, so on the last slide of this presentation, there's gonna be a QR code that you can scan and it'll link you directly to this website. There are lots and lots of apps out there. I know it can be overwhelming to know which are the best, which are free. Um, so these are apps that I have personally tried myself. And for meditation, if that's something you're hoping to get into, Calm and Headspace are kind of the top two out there. They, they have some free options, um, but a lot of the, the good stuff on there is, you know, 
with the premium account, but I would still recommend checking out Calm and maybe if you're new to meditating, trying to do just like the 10 minute daily Calm that they offer. Um, Insight Timer is probably the most popular free version out there. So I would recommend that. There's several different courses you can take based on whatever it is that you may be experiencing. And then there's also balance. Um, and then as far as mood tracking, journaling, or habit tracking, I highly encourage that for people to, you know, it helps to see what, what you've done in the last month, for example. Or, you know, if you don't have those goals written down, it's often hard to get motivated to, to do them and even remember them. So um, my personal favorite is the Habit Tracker app. Um, it's totally free and it's very user friendly. So it's a great way to, you know, if you want to do a certain goal for push ups per day or meditate once a day, it's a great way to kind of get on there and just track and see, you know, how you've done it for that month. Um, books, I highly encourage, you know, there's lots of self help books. Um, available through your library. So if you've never heard of Hoopla and Libby, these are great apps. And if you have a local library card, it actually links with those accounts. And then you have access to a lot of a lot of free books, audiobooks and um, like Kindle books as well. And then last on there is tapping. So there's something called EFT tapping that focuses on hitting different acupressure points. And it's something you can pretty much do anywhere, um, whether you're feeling stressed or overwhelmed. And so there is an app called Tapping Solution, and it walks you through exactly how to do it. Um, and people have found that to be pretty successful as well. And this was found on um, the CAPS website. So a lot of uh, apps that they have listed on there as well. Um, I have not tried all of these. However, I have tried a lot of them. Um, but if you're looking for more, I would highly recommend going to the CAPS website and looking to see what apps are on there. I do believe it is also on the, um, the QR code link that you're going to see. It's also listed on there as well. And this is the QR code. <laughs> so we are finished with our presentation today. Um, at the bottom there, you'll see our phone number if you have any questions for us after this as well, um, or if you're interested in scheduling an appointment with any of our providers, counselors, or health coaches. All right, one last person to talk for today um, before we get started on the, the questions. So we have Christy Thompson Baker. She is joining us on online. Online, um, she um, got her bachelor's and her master's of science from Mizzou in animal science, and her PhD from Purdue in poultry nutrition. Um, she works for Elanco, which is a, a division that, um, of Eli Lilly, from what I understand, that focuses on animal health. And she can talk a little more about that. From what I saw from her bio, she is a senior scientist with nutritional health, a portfolio management for food animal R&D, a senior director for operational excellence. And she says her day job is all about finding opportunities to simplify and helping groups accomplish it. So please welcome Christy. Hello. Thanks for having me. Huh. Um, I did have one slide, but I don't know that it got included. Um, so I'm not going to worry too much about that unless uh, we need it. So um, let's pull that up real quick. Uh, so I think the, the purpose for me joining today was to link sort of the real world application and how Elanco uses um, the connection with animals and the uh, that way to connect and to become more authentic and have that sense of belonging that we try to create at the company that I work with. And um, that comes in a lot of different ways. And, and some of the things is, as you all were each talking that really connected with me is just, so Elanco has um, a couple different things that help us create that sense of belonging. Um, one of them is that we have time as volunteers to do whatever we want and we have the option to do that with animals. So I can, the Indiana, the Indiana Canine Assistance Network, which works with service animals, 
um, all these different opportunities where we can volunteer and connect not only with each other, but bring animals into our workspace. And so we have a program too where we, we have animals on site um, as well as is to create that sense of, um, of well-being. I'm not entirely sure on the, the perceived effectiveness of coming together and feeling together is very much attached with that sense of connection, right? And so having animals on site, having service animals, all of those pieces allow us to, to have a greater connection than what we might have otherwise or might not have otherwise when we're on site. Um, we also have um, something called, and, and this is what I, I heard but was never said, it's something called psychological safety, which is a really important concept when it comes to this sense of belonging and feeling. And what it is, is people feel safe to speak up and to speak their truth nice, nicely, but able to feel comfortable enough to say their thoughts and doing that makes for a great makes great business sense because if you have a group of people in a room and someone doesn't agree often they won't say anything if they're not psychologically safe so you've now just lost that diversity of thought because this person didn't feel safe enough to say something and we've learned time and again that when you don't have that sense of belonging and that psychological safety you do miss those little things and those ultimately can derail entire projects. And so I think one of our learnings was initially milk. We were talking with customers about purchasing of milk and what they do with, with that and realized that we were talking with the entirely wrong people because who buys milk? The mothers, the fathers, primarily mothers at that point that we were doing survey. And you get a whole different perspective when you make sure that you're including everyone and that everyone is, is bringing their best selves and their best questions and their psychological safety to work with them. And so implementing that in a business environment is really hard, but you can do it with a number of different uh, methodologies, similar to what they've discussed in the, in the previous slides as well. Um, and so that's that's sort of the, the business side of it or the real world application that I see in my day to day job. Um, I didn't have any slides because I was just going to act as part of the panel. Um, I definitely don't have it all figured out. I think the people that presented really do have it figured out. And so I'm happy to, to talk about the work side experience, um, but would we'll turn it back over to the group. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions for anybody. So um, Janelle, I don't know if you want to come back up front, um, and then um, I'll let you share this. Christy, can you hear me? I can. Hi, this is Lynette. Question for you. So you mentioned that Elenco, I'm not sure if you spelled out or share what Elenco stands for, because I'm not sure everyone knows, um, if you can share that with us. And then um, also, if someone were trying to implement such a program in their space, office spaces, what would where would they start? What would that look like? With Great the support? questions. Yeah. Uh, so Elanco, ironically enough, stands for Eli, Lily, and Company. We are the animal health, we were the animal health branch of Eli, Lily. They sold us off two or three years ago. Um, so now we just are single standing as Elanco. Um, and to implement something like this in a workplace, there, there's a couple different initiatives that occur within our workplace. One is the psychological safety that I spoke to. And then the secondary one is bringing animals on site and, and um incorporating them into the day-to-day. -day. So the, I'll, I'll start, start on the animal side first. We initially, there was a lot of reluctance to do that. I think there is generally speaking. Um, and so we started with ICANN actually because those were service dogs. So those are the service dogs that are trained in the prisons and then people called furloughers take them for three weeks at a time and take them everywhere. So 
we were then cleared because technically they are service animals, even though they're service animals in training, we were cleared to bring them to Atlanta. So we worked with our HR to make sure that we had covered all the concerns and all the bases that they had before doing any of it. And then that was the first step. So did that, that worked really well. We had about 10 individuals who did the volunteering and, and brought in the service animals on their own and had very few issues. Uh, so then start, started to see the success there, which then sort of led to, you know, maybe we should do other animals. And so then we had animals that were in Pet Pals, which is, I'm not sure if it's an organization or a certification, sort of like the Canine Good Citizen certification. But these were people who were coming to work and then going to a hospital, a nursing facility, um, schools with their dogs to do a session, a therapeutic session. And so we realized that those dogs were also really well behaved. And then that uh, sort of allowance was extended to those pet partner dogs. Then uh, having seen the success, and I can tell you walking down a hall with a dog, you can just plan on not getting to your meetings on time because everyone stops you because they wanna, they wanna pet the animal, right? They don't even know it. They're seeking that belonging and that comfort if they're an animal person. Um, and, and so they'll stop you and it opens up so many con conversations and um, connections. So anyways, we had the pet partners and now Elanco just started on bringing your own pet to work. And so we're doing a pilot program with 10 people who have their dogs sort of um, pre-screened and they bring their dogs in now. So at any given time, you could have about 20 animals on site at Elanco, although post COVID, I don't think all of us are there that often. Um, but it, it was very much an incremental uh, implementation. So see something that works, do something more, it works, do something more. Um, the key, I think, was getting leadership buy-in. So not only from your top leader, but then from people like HR um, and making sure that you have dogs that are going to be really good ambassadors of the program. So be very specific and choosy. <laughs> You don't want a dog that barks at people or snaps or uh, basically distracts from it. So that that's how I would probably go about doing that piece. Um, and then on the psychological safety, we've just started a huge um, initiative, essentially asking people, why don't you feel psychologically safe? And what is it that we can do to help with that? And then created a trained set of facilitators who now go into team meetings, who go into any sort of situation where we feel like maybe we could optimize our team dynamics. And they'll go in and facilitate a couple sessions and help us figure out what the issues are. Um, this personally has worked for me beautifully. And one team of 12 people, I had some some disagreements that just were never coming to a head and no one would speak up. And so our facilitator came in and it changed my team from sort of somewhat dysfunctional to almost a dream team. So that piece also is really important to that sense of belonging within um, our Elanco culture. Wait, I have another question. Oh. <laughs> I have several questions. Um, but I was hoping that we had questions, but since not. Tips for food prep. Is there a site that Purdue has for folks if they're interested in eating a healthier meal? By the way, there are great snacks outside. Um, please take them before you leave. Um, do we have that available at Purdue? And then my other question is, um, to Elenko's point, does Purdue offer these trained set of facilitators to come into meetings or sit in meetings? Do we have that on our campus? Um, yeah, so for food prep, I, maybe Whitney's aware of, of a resource Purdue has, um, but none that come to mind initially. But um, if you do come to health coaching sessions, um, that is something that we talk about um, and work with you on, you know, whatever works for your lifestyle. Um, so we can do in-person appointments or virtual appointments, whatever works for you. Um, but I'm not a aware of any um, online resource, are you? 
Not necessarily. Um, like she said, you can always come to one of us and we can work through that with you. Um, I know there's a great website called Budget Bites that is a good starting point. Um, and then I know for students as well, there's also um, offerings through the COREC where they can get one-on-one -on -one free nutritional counseling and possibly planning that way. Um, but yeah. Yeah, there's several cooking demonstrations on there, and Purdue Extension actually offers a lot of great nutritional information and meal planning advice. Health, uh, health coaching is no charge either, uh, to, to we're also, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then as far as um, animal facilitators on campus, I'm only familiar with um, very like situational um, events. So like during exams, there's a, like a puppy puppy day or puppy. There was a, there was an opportunity to go pet puppies, um, and then like you'll find um, or I've heard of smaller groups on campus doing like small half day events kind of thing, but nothing as far as in the workplace um, for just like your day to day actions. And then a note on that, um, the Indiana Canine Assistance Network actually has a group that uh, works from with IU, so they're their own IU club. And so if there were interest in that, I would say you should contact ICANN and see if you could get a Purdue club going. Um, and they actually do put dogs with students at IU for three weeks at a time. It's a great exposure for the dogs, and it's, of course, the students love it. Um, so if you're interested, you I, I can provide you with the contact information from for ICANN. Um, and then with regard to the psychological safety, we don't have anyone that is paid specifically to do that job. They take it on as a facilitator because they're interested in it. Um, and so it's just sort of a, an extra thing that they can do. And so I would say for, for Purdue, you would want just a motivated group of people who think that there's power here and can, and can help um, you know, take you down that path of psychological safety. Thank you for that. And someone just posted online that Purdue Food Link is a great resource. Um, and they're putting on there that the Purdue Extension Nutrition mm -hmm. Education Program, Eat, Gather, Go, is also another great resource. So um, my other question was for our uh, colleague from Willowstone, do you have partner agencies across the state that provide the same services? And also, um, you mentioned internships for students. I realize you all go beyond just the psychological. Are there internships outside of just maybe a psych or HHS major? Great questions. Um, so as far as port partner organizations, um, we we don't have any like like other locations, for instance. Um, but some of the services that we provide are provided in other regions of the state by other agencies. So, for example, Baby Talk and Healthy Families are both um, evidence-based programs that are um, offered in many other places over the state. Um, they they have even networks where they kind of coordinate who's covering what area. Um, and Get Smart is also offered in other, other areas of the state. I think they're expanding at least into the surrounding counties of, of Tippecanoe County. Um, but as far as the mental health counseling, we, we do not have other locations. Willowstone exists primarily to serve Tippecanoe and the surrounding counties. Um, but so that's unfortunately, no, we don't have like locations in Northwest or at Fort Wayne. Um, as far as the internships, that, I'm so glad that they asked that because the internships are actually not for psychology students. Um, we don't have any um, current counseling internships and any counseling internships we would have would need to be with master's level students. Uh, we are in talks kind of trying to develop that over the next couple of years, but we haven't implemented it yet. The internships are actually um, in marketing, um, writing, um, you know, more technology-based things, sort of the, the services that help us do what we do. All right, well, we want to um, give one line, a round of applause. I can't even talk for our panelists today. Thank you to everybody that joined online. Thank you, Christy, for joining us online as a panelist. Um, and anybody that's in the room, please feel free to take the swag that's out there on the table, 
the little baskets, some, some healthy, healthy treats. So, um, and thank you again for coming today. We appreciate it.